T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, 0, and lift off. Coach on Fire Radio. Welcome to Brave Healing Words That Change the World. I am Laura DeFranco, and my mission is to start a revolution of brave healers who are healing themselves and the world by sharing their stories. On this podcast, we're going to have the conversations you crave, the ones that create a ripple. Um, Oh my goodness, you guys can find all things Brave Healing at bravehealer.com and on Facebook at Brave Healer by Laura DeFranco. And Brave Healing, A Guide for Your Journey, it's my new book, you guys, and it's out, and that came out on June 1st by Possibilities Publishing Company. Maybe there's something you haven't learned yet that could change everything. This is that book. Grab it on Amazon. So now I'm going to invite you all to take a deep breath with me and really arrive here in the moment, in your body. Let yourself feel the words today. Notice how a word or a tone or a topic feels inside of you. Feeling is healing. And today I have someone who can talk about that. This is Miss Kathy Anello that I am welcoming today. And she is the author of the book called Six Months to Live, Making Each Day Matter. She is a certified healing intuitive host of the podcast, Making Each Day Matter, and co-host of the popular blog talk radio show, Best Life Cafe. Her passion for spirituality and emotional health evolved naturally through her career in fitness and mind-body instruction. Her experience in leading classes and motivating people to strengthen their bodies through movement, their minds, with meditation and humor led to her current career in broadcasting and writing please make sure to visit her website at kathyanello.com. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. That was a great introduction. Thank oh, you. good. I, I'm practicing those, you know. <laughs> well, I love I'm, the name of your show, Brave Healing. I think that that is um, what it takes to heal, and I really resonate with the title of this show. Oh, thank you. You know, I always say this journey isn't for sissies. It really takes a warrior (laughs) to kind of show up. It's true, right? So true. Yeah, just to show up for the stuff of our lives and do it with awareness. And it it is not an easy road, but it's totally worth it. And you know that. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so I got to start by talking to you about, um, you mentioned something about why people choose work or money over people and or themselves in life. I want to hear more about that. Let's start there. Ah, Boy, how did that start for me? I I mean, I think that there's a certain time period in our life where we believe that we have to go out and make all this money to make life work. And, and, and it does, I mean, obviously you have to have money to live and, but we put a lot of emphasis on it. For me personally, I was, um, trying to have a career and a home life and a mothering life all at the same time. And work took so much over that I was neglecting the parts of my life that really made me happy. And so it was like, when I was unraveling, you know, my story is a lot longer than that because what happened, what made me look at that was because I lost my job. And then it was like, I had wasted so much time and energy into someone who could literally cast me aside in four seconds. And I mean, years of my life, um, that I I just had this awareness that I had given up so much to make that work. And in the end, it didn't even matter. So why would I give up the things that make me feel alive for that, for the, for the paycheck when usually in life, it always works out. Like if, like I lost my job, I didn't know how I was going to live. And then somehow magically I did. And I haven't worked at a, at a traditional job for four years and I 
somehow managed to make it, you know? So it's like now in retrospect, I go back and say that job was killing me. I was miserable. I was crying every day. I was having panic attacks every day. I was overweight. I was gray haired. I didn't even, I don't even remember looking in the mirror at myself, just wanting, you know, I was answering emails at 10 at night and really focused on, and I was making really good money. So the money was kind of like giving me the fuel to keep that lifestyle of that pace going. And then that pace dropped off the map and I had nothing. And I was like, wow, okay. So now I have to find out what's really, who I really am and what I'm really about and what's really important because the emphasis I put on that in the end showed me nothing. Well, you know, I know that I did this for a long time. I put off my own joy. Mm-hmm. And so I know this is something you think about and talk about and you've been through quite a lot. But So why do you think we do that for so long, especially when it's, we know it's the key to living a happy life? Why do people put that joy off? Wow, that's... <laughs> that is a million dollar question. It I is. think I think that we forget about joy. And when we're in that pace or in the muck of a situation whether it's work or home whatever relation, you know, relationship whenever anything is really like um taking and consuming us in a toxic way, we can literally forget that joy exists because that is truly what happened to me. And when I was unraveling my life after that situation, I had an awesome therapist who said, you have a, you have time off. So now you're going to take two hours a day and you're going to do something that makes you happy. That makes you feel an emotion called joy. And when, and so I was like, okay, I'll take that challenge. (laughs) <laughs> and so it was really wonderful little things that I would find, you know, getting your nails done, reading a book, laying at the pool, going hiking, having lunches, um, little things. And then when I, I would start to get this feeling in my stomach that I still get whenever I know it's a joy jump and that's what I call it. It's <laughs> like that little ing in your side, Gabrielle Bernstein calls it an ing. Like if you get a feeling and you go, ah, this is, this is it. This is what makes me feel alive. This is a true thing. This is authentic. This is me being authentic. And once you start feeling those feelings, you start remembering joy and laughter and happiness. And so for me, it was really a process of remembering, of remembering. And once I remembered and, and started to condition myself to seek out joyful moments through this exercise, I, I was wired. I was rewired. And so I think the reason is that we, we push that joy aside. We forget that it exists. We forget that you can have a balanced life that consists of work and joy and that money shouldn't be the driving force to forget the joy. You know, even the simplest joys, you don't need money to go for a hike in the woods, you know? (laughs) That is for sure, man. That was probably the most awesome homework ever given to you by any therapist. It was (laughs) life-changing, absolutely life-changing. Yes. And I I still, you know, bank on that a lot during my times of trouble now, because even though that, you know, I wrote this book, I still have many things that have come up that I'm like, Oh, you know, I got to go back and do the work again. And I'll start, I'll I'll drag that exercise out of my, you know, bag of tricks and say, okay, for a week, you're going to do something that gives you self love every day or gives you self joy every day, because you have to remember that this is why we're here. This is what life is about. Yes. It's so important. And you're right. It comes up in layers. It comes up again and again and Mm -hmm. again. And we have to continue to remember, you know, what good feels like and what joy feels like. And then only when we're really fully feeling, are we able to aim ourselves at it over and over again? If we, you know, we were so good at the suffering, right? So we get, we get good at it. We're reacting to it. We're problem solving. We're doing all that stuff. And we totally forget what the, what the joy feels like, or even that we have like permission to go for it. Um, I know I had to give myself permission to go for it. I felt like I had been taught other things, you know, besides that, um, you, uh, you link this up to, um, talking about what we tolerate. So like we, oh man, this, uh, when I read this one line, when I was preparing for this interview, I'm like, damn, you know, what we tolerate is 
is amazing to me. It's so much. We tolerate such toxicity and negativity and I could go on and on, but so I would like to flip the switch on this and talk about what we need to do instead to like get over the fear and uncertainty and just let go. Tell me what you do. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's such a, I wrote that chapter. That was the first chapter I ever wrote in the book. And the reason that that came up for me first was because I realized that I was tolerating unspeakable things and not just in my work life, but other areas of my life that I don't really talk about in the book much. But when I look back on the tolerating, um, I, I feel like you put up an invisible wall that you almost like block it out. That's it's even happening. What I had to do was make a list and I had to say, where am I requiring the most tolerance right now? For me at that point, it was my job that I was allowing this person to speak to me in a demeaning manner every day, that I was watching women leave our workplace because they complained. You know, I was watching and, and my integrity was being challenged every day and I was tolerating it for the paycheck. And so I think we tolerate for different reasons, but I think that um, I had to just make a list of what the financial, personal, and emotional cost was. And once I did that, it was like, well, the cost of this is costing me my sanity. The cost of this is costing me my health. The cost of this is costing me um, being in a toxic situation, you know, and, and not being, and isolating myself because sometimes when we're in toxic situations, we isolate. So I had to really just say, you know, if you live a truly authentic life, then you're not tolerating anything because it dissipates tolerance because you're just being true to who you are. And I had spent so many years not being true to who I was. Oh my God. You got to repeat that. If, ah. if you're truly living an authentic life, tell me the rest. It dissipates the tolerance. It dissipates. It. Oh my goodness. You guys know how important this idea is. I think yeah. some people will be lit. And I'm sitting here knowing that people can't see me, but nodding my head like over yeah, and, and over I have, again. <laughs> I have goosebumps because yeah. you know, the thing is, is that um, because when you're living authentic and you're living truth, it's the opposite of tolerance. Because then you're like, you said in the very beginning, it takes a warrior, you know, like you are standing up in your truth. And sometimes, in fact, almost all the time, it is one of the hardest things to do because you have to go stand up and say, here's what's true. And a lot of people aren't going to like it, <laughs> but living your truth is what is the opposite of being tolerant. And so for me, stepping into my truth and then also having that tool to bank on when I'm stepping out of my truth, because of course we, we still do, um, reminds me, you know, it just reminds me that if I'm being true to myself then I'm not tolerating anything, you know, my boundaries are up and I'm clear with what's true for me. And I'm, and when I'm tolerating, everything goes brick and haywire. Well, and that's the awareness practice, right? So yeah. everything inside of this that we're talking about is being able to feel, being able to step a, a giant step outside of ourselves and watch our own behavior, watch our own thoughts, you know, watch how we're reacting to things. And if we're actually staying in integrity with that authenticity, it's, um, whew, it's tough, yeah. tough work some days. You know, and we also, tolerance is, a, is kind of a form of avoidance, mm. you know, and so we, I have used that as a defense mechanism just to get through situations that I am in in, in my life. Like, oh, so it's like, too. yeah, so if you just <laughs> tolerate, then you don't have to look at the work. You don't have to look at what really is going on. And so it's sort of a defense mechanism to get through. And everybody's situation is different. You might have to tolerate, like I talk about in the book, like, foster children. I was a foster parent many years ago. And I know that for them, what a hard situation it is to be ripped out of your house and then put into another house with a stranger, but they have to learn tolerance, you know? And so there's situations where tolerance is practical for survival. Mm, yes. You know what I mean? And, yeah. but, but, but those are real life situations when I'm tolerating a, a, you know, person coming at me, that's toxic. That's my work because I can say that's not okay you know, not. So I think that it's kind of a mixed bag and, but, but people tolerate things for many different reasons, you know, uh, 
we've talked about the movements that are happening in the world today where women are standing up and saying, actually, this did happen to me. Actually, this did happen to me, you know, and they tolerated and kept